Hello, National Baptist. I know it is evident that if you're watching this virtual convention, that God, through all everything that we're going through, has been your protector in the midst of this pandemic. The Savior has been your security while we're going through all of this sickness and suffering. It would have been an honor to see each and every one of you, as always, in our annual session. But right now, we must remain safe. To our president, Dr. Young, and the staff, and all of the officers, we thank them for coming together and doing what needs to be done in this unprecedented time. Keep our president in your prayers as he's leading us into new heights in which we've never seen before and doing something that we've never done before. We pray that God will continually keep you safe and sound until we can all meet together again. Our first preacher needs no introduction. He is a preacher's preacher. He's known all over this country for his unique style of preaching in his own Texas way. He is the proud pastor of the Mount Olive Missionary Baptist Church of Fort Worth, Texas. He is a true friend. He is also a faithful servant of God. Whatever you ask this preacher to do, he's willing and faithful enough to do it. Humility is just a normal part of his characteristic. I know you're going to be blessed tonight by none other than Dr. William T. Glenn from Fort Worth, Texas. Let's hear what the man of God has to say about the Word of God. The message for today is found in Psalm 46, verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. I want to talk today about in times like these. Psalm 46 was written out of the crucible of extreme adversity. It relates to anyone who is in a time of trouble. It tells us that when trouble strikes, God is sufficient to get us through. Here is the truth. Trouble will strike. Not in some of our lives, but in all of our lives. Trouble will strike the godly. We are not immune from troubles and problems. The abundant life is not a trouble-free life. Job says in the midst of his affliction that man born of a woman is of a few days and they are full of trouble. Jesus, that man who knew more about life and living than any man that has ever lived, says in this world you will have tribulations. But be of good cheer, for I have overcome the world. We don't know the exact circumstances in which these words were written, but they are clearly written in the context of troublesome times. We don't know what the trouble was, but we know that whoever penned these words found themselves in the midst of trouble. And whatever the nature of your trouble, I want to tell you today, don't throw in the towel. Don't give in to despair. This psalm, Psalm 46, says to all of us that God can be trusted when the whole world goes crazy. Here is what he's saying. In times like these, pandemic, economic downturn, racial 
attention. Maniac leading the nation. Amen. Broken relationships. Failing health. Depleted finances. Whatever's going on in your life. The psalmist says God is sufficient to get you through. In Psalm 46, the inspired penman, whoever it was. Many folk just attribute all of the Psalms to David. About 77 Psalms of the 150 were probably written about David, the others by other inspired writers. Whoever God inspired to pen these words uh, offers us three things that God will be to us in our time of trouble. What he's saying to you and I today from where we are is that in times like these, God through his word offers to be three things to us. The first is God is our refuge. The word refuge is in the beginning, the middle, and the end of Psalm 46. Beginning, the middle, the end, the psalmist wants us to know that God is our refuge. The word refuge means shelter. It's the picture of a hiding place in the time of a storm. God is our refuge. God is our place to run to in the time of trouble. And here it is. We all need a place to run to when we are afraid. When you were a child, whenever you were afraid, you ran to your parents. God doesn't have grown folk. All he has is children. T to remind us that from cradle to grave, whenever we get afraid in times of trouble, we can run to him. All creatures in their distress run to their refuge. Instinctively, in the animal kingdom, they always find them a refuge, a place to run to in times of distress and despair. And if the great God of creation has placed that in an animal, in lower life, Surely he has placed that and more in his higher, highest creation, you and I. Where do you run when you are afraid, when you are in trouble? The psalmist says God is our refuge. He says that God is a dependable Refuge, shelter, hiding place for his people when everything around them seems to be falling apart. We've never seen anything like where we are right now. Everything appears to be falling apart. And the psalmist says today, God is a dependable refuge, shelter, hiding place when everything around you seems to be falling apart. Now, 
He offers this refuge. But he doesn't protect us to pamper us. But rather to prepare us to go back to life with its duties and its dangers. Amen. Each person stands in need of a refuge, a place of security when the storms of life beat down on us. God is our refuge, which says he is our storm cellar when the tornadoes come. But God is our fallout shelter when the events of life explode over our heads. But then God is our high tower when the waves of defeat and disaster beat at our feet. God is our refuge, but then secondly, he assures us that God is our strength. Amen. He is our strength because those of us who've lived any time at all are well aware of the fact that we can't win this battle called life in our own strength. Sometimes as we deal with trouble, we find ourselves stressed from the battle that would just give out. We come to the end of our rope and we've all been there. And then sometimes our strength fades because of the enormity of our trouble, the intensity of our trouble, the length of our trouble. How many times you've been in tr trouble and you've wondered and you even asked God, how long must I bear this burden? How long must I be under this heavy load? And then God delivered you. And when you look back, you never would have believed before you went through that you could, ever could have made it through all of that. You didn't do it on your own. Psalm says God is our refuge and strength. God provides strength for our infirmities. Paul over in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 talks about being caught up in the third heaven. He heard and he saw some things that he says I can't even talk about but to keep me from becoming boastful for swelling up in pride about having experience others haven't had, had he says that was given to me a thorn in the flesh that word thorn is not a thistle we see on a rose bush or something but in the Greek it's literally a wooden stake Paul says it was painful to the point that I prayed and I asked the Lord on three different occasions to remove it. And God says, no, no, no. To remind us, that song is that, that Jesus will never say no is not scripturally sound. Yes, he will. And I thank God I've lived long enough that I can thank him now for some for the many things he said no to. Paul says, I've got this thorn and I was convinced that I could serve God better and do work in a greater way if God would remove that thorn, pray three times, and God says no. 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 And then Paul says he answers. And here was his answer. My grace is sufficient for you. Paul, here's what you need to understand. My strength is made perfect.
perfect in your weakness. Sometimes you wonder when you look at all that Paul did. Mighty evangelists. Organized churches throughout Asia. Wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. What all could he have done had he not had that thorn? The reality is he probably never would have done all of that without the thorn. That's why when Paul looks at it and he sums it up, he says, when I am weak, then am I strong. God gives us strength, a, a, a sufficient grace. In the midst of our infirmities. But then God provides strength for service. Have you ever noticed that one of the things about whatever it is God gives you to do, the things that you're really certain God wants you to do it, one of the ways you can be certain about it is that it's always what appears to be impossible. Something that is beyond you. Amen. But Paul says in Philippians 4 and 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. God doesn't strengthen us to sit but to serve. And no matter how impossible it may appear to be, God has promised that he will give us strength to accomplish, to fulfill his will in our lives. But then God provides strength for our weakness. Amen. God provides strength for our weakness. God knows that we are no match for the devil, for the world, and even times like these. But Isaiah says he gives power to the weak and to those who have no might, he increases strength. But they that wait upon the Lord. If ever there was a verse for these times, but they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. How much strength? To mount up on wings like eagles. To run and not get weary. To walk and not faint. God is our refuge. God is our strength. But then finally he says, God is our help. A very present help in trouble. In times of crisis, the Jewish leaders were often pronged to turn to Egypt for help when they should have turned to the Lord and trusted him. It is believed that this psalm grew out of an experience when Israel was surrounded by Assyria. They were outgunned, outmanned, and all they could do was put the city on lockdown. They couldn't run to anyone else to try to get some allies to join in with them in this aggression by Syria. It is believed that in this experience, this experience grows out of a time when they were surrounded by the Syrian army but God sent an angel. One angel. 
then cut them down like a brand new lawn mower, mower over some grass. And the psalmist says he is a very present help. That in your trouble, God can be found. He can be found when he is needed. The NIV renders it this way. He is an ever present help. Ever present help. He is always there. Sometimes you can't feel him, you can't see him. You even doubt, but then when you get through and look in the rearview mirror, you throw up your hands and declare, he was there all the time. The secret of this confidence is the consciousness of the nearness of God. He is a very present help in trouble. The original Hebrew text says God allows himself to be found in narrow places. You ever play hide and go seek in the house? When I was growing up, we, we never played it in the day. We always played it at night. We'd hide in the house in the dark. And that person who was it had to stumble through the darkness. They knew it was anywhere from six to eight others in there. But the quest was to find them in the dark. Amen. Didn't want to be found. Even in the dark, we'd get in closets and under beds and behind the couch. The psalmist says, in your dark times, <laughs> God's not hiding. He allows himself to be, he's there. Amen. And he allows himself to be found. Amen. He says, in times of trouble, he's easy to find. Nemo's dad and a fish named Dory spent an entire movie trying to find little Nemo. God is not as hard to find as Nemo. The psalmist says he is a very present help in trouble. That word trouble describes people in a tight place, in a corner, unable to get out. There are times when life will begin to tighten up on you. There are times when, when life will back you in a corner and you have no way of escape. Who hasn't been in a corner, a tight place. The psalmist says, don't worry. He is a very present help. What does that mean? That means he is right now. Everything we need. Amen. In this pandemic, in this economic downturn, in the midst of racial tension and everything else we are dealing with at this time and that's just about everything else that he is everything we need he is a very present help Psalm 46 the emphasis of this entire psalm 
is on the presence of the Lord with his people in the changes and difficulties of life. One of the hardest things it is to deal with at this time is how quickly everything changed. How quickly difficulties rose up. Stuff! We never thought would happen we'd ever see. Happen overnight. Did you ever imagine that there'd come a Sunday when you couldn't come to church and you was well and had clothes and gas in your car? That you'd have to sit at home and watch a live stream of Facebook That when you wanted to join people to pray, you'd have to dial in. That in 2020, we'd see the worst economic downturn since the Great Depression. That in 2020, people would have to get out in the streets again and march for justice. That loved ones would get sick and you couldn't go to the hospital. Die and you couldn't have a public funeral. And yet today, in the midst of all of that and a whole lot more, God has been our refuge and strength and a very present help in trouble and some folk hear us talk about how we love and we trust him and hear words of praise still falling from our lips and, and they think we're crazy yet we affirm that even in the midst of all of this God is still Good. And in spite of times like these, God is still worthy to be praised. Because in spite of these times, he has never failed me yet. And I want to remind you, this is not the first time we've ever been to a place like this. This is not the first time we've ever uh, found ourselves uh, in trouble. And that's why, uh, yes, Lord, uh, those saints of old could be heard singing, uh, I've seen uh, the lightning flash, and I've heard uh, the thunder roll. And I've felt sin breaking, uh, dashing, uh, trying uh, to conquer my soul. But I heard uh, the voice of Jesus uh, telling me uh, still uh, to fight on. Yes, Lord. Uh, and they could be heard saying, uh, he promised never to leave me. Never uh, to leave me alone. No, never alone. No, never alone. He promised uh, never to leave me. Uh, never uh, to leave me alone. And I thank God uh, that's part of my testimony in this present situation. That in the midst of it all, God has been my refuge. He hides me. But then the Lord 
has been my strength and help in this time of trouble that it just doesn't hide me but I thank God he helps me yes Lord I read uh, a story of a mother uh, who found her young daughter going through a new book of Bible stories she had just bought and given to a child and that little girl had a marker and she had that new Bible story book and she was going through it circling the word God that she found on every page her mother asked her why in the world are you doing that and that little girl answered so I'll know where to find God when I need him and brothers and sisters that's not a bad idea and I want to ask you do you know where to find him when you really need him the psalmist says he's closer than you think and when you really need him he will allow himself to be found because he is a very present help in trouble brothers and sisters it's rough out here right now we've never seen anything like this before we're in tough times we're in hard times we've never seen times like this before so here is my word to you yes Lord in times like these you need a savior in times like these you need an anchor be very sure be very sure your anchor holds and grips the solid rock this rock is Jesus yes he is the one yes Lord this rock is Jesus he is the only one be very sure be very sure your anchor holds and grips the solid rock I thank God in times like these I've got a refuge I've got a place yes Lord I've got a person to run to I thank God that same person is my strength that same person allows himself to be found in my time of trouble and his name is Jesus yes he is the one he is the only one have I got a witness I want to tell you I thank God before these times came I took time to know him oh it's dangerous to get caught in a storm and don't have a place to run to it's dangerous to get caught in a storm and don't know where to run don't know who to run to but I thank God I got Jesus and he's enough he walks with me he talks with me he holds my hand and he guides my feet I thank God when I need him I can bow down on my knees and have a little talk with Jesus tell him all about my troubles anybody here know he hears he answers and he shows up the psalmist says 
he is a very present help in trouble. He's not just help, but he's help that's present. Very present. Help that's not present can't do you any good. Have I got a witness? I thank God. He's always there. Anybody here know he's able? Anybody here know he can? Anybody here know he will? Ain't he all right? Ain't he all right? Ain't he all right? He's all you my testimony my testimony is when it comes to Jesus can't nobody do me like Jesus can't nobody do me like the Lord yes he picks me up when I'm down takes me in when I'm out cheers me when I'm sad gives me joy for my sorrow Took my hate, gave me his love, took my poverty and gave me his provision, took my confusion and gave me his peace, and that's why I can't help but praise his name, that's why I can't help but bless his name, the psalmist says the world may be coming apart. Earthquake, tidal waves, destruction on every hand. But God is my refuge. God is my strength. He is a very present help in the time of trouble. I'm leaning. I'm dependent. I'm trusting in Jesus. It's rough, times are hard, it's tough right now, but I got this word, I don't believe he's brought me this far to leave me now, I've come too far from where I started from, anybody here know he's able, anybody here know he will, can you help me? Praise him right now. Can you help me? Bless him right now. Can you help me? Thank him right now. But when I look back over my life and think about the goodness of Jesus and all he's done for me, he's been so good, he's done so much, he's brought me so far, I can't help but praise him right now, I praise him for what he's already done. But then, every time I turn around, he keeps on blessing me. They sang it when I was a boy. I didn't understand it then, but I understand it now. And even more in this pandemic, in this downturn of the economy, in the midst of all of this racial tension and everything else I heard them old folks say the Lord is blessing me right now the Lord 
is blessing me right now. Since he's blessing me right now, I've got a right now praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. praise him right now but then I'm not going to wait till I get on the other side of this I'm going to praise him I'm going to praise him on my way through I'm going to praise him for everything he's getting ready to do I'm going to praise him for what he's about to do not about to but about to you ought to give him some about to praise. He's about to open that door. He's about to make a way. He's about to restore your health. He's about to restore your joy. He's about to bring a wandering child back home. He's about to restore your relationship. You ought to praise him. You ought to praise him. You ought to praise him. sermon bless you give some late night love wherever you're at right now to the one and only William Timothy Glenn I told you you were going to be blessed by this unique talented and gifted anointed wonderful preacher just like any other time when we come together just like any other time when late night services meet that we need to ask you to do what needs to be done, that everything financially would be taken care of. We also encourage each and every one of you to make sure you're registered. If you have not registered yet, you still have time to register. Our convention is going through something right now. This even virtual convention costs, but we lost our Congress this year, which put a financial bind on our whole convention. So we're asking each and every one of you to make sure that you register. For these services on tonight, I ask you just as if I was still standing on a stage in a ballroom at late night service, we ask each and every one of you to hit whatever button that you want to that's on the screen right Right now to tap that and give at least a $25 offering. We're asking you to sow this seed as you always do. I never have to worry about my late night crowd because they are not just worshipers, but they know worship is a part of giving. And so we ask you tonight to make sure that you be a giver. Click on one of the tabs that you see on the screen right now, whichever one will fit you best, and make sure that you give at least a $25 offering. I appreciate your fellowship, I appreciate your support, and I appreciate your love. Our last speaker is the living legend of our convention now. He is one that is known not just across this country, he is known all over this world. He has a gift of being able to quote scripture by his own self without reading the book or the word of God. He knows that whatever he preaches is coming directly from his heart and the spirit of God. He has blessed so many through all of these four, over four decades of preaching. He is my pastor. He is my father. He is my friend. And I want to introduce now our second speaker of tonight, the proud eminent pastor of the New Salem Missionary Baptist Church in Memphis Tennessee, Reverend Dr. Frank E. Ray Sr. Let's hear again what the man of God has to say about the word of God. God said, let us make man. That's enough. That's enough. Thank you. <clears throat> there was a senior sage sister in a kitchen preparing a delicious, delightful, delectable meal for dinner. She had her six-year-old grandson in the house irritating the daylights out of her. 
it was difficult for her to cook while the sun was beckoning for her attention. And finally, she tried to give her son things to do to keep him occupied. She said to him, carry out the garbage. She carried it out, came right back. She said to him, make up your bed. He went and made the bed up and came right back. She looked for something she could give him that would keep him occupied while she was cooking. She found a puzzle with a picture of a globe of the world. She scrambled the puzzle up into many pieces and gave to her grandson and said, go in the other room, baby, and put this puzzle together while mama is cooking. He went in, and in five minutes, he came back with the puzzle complete. Grandma sit down. She said, baby, how in the world could you put together a picture of the world in five minutes? He said, Grandma, what I did was I turned the picture on the back side. And on the back side was a picture of a man said, all I did was put him in place, and the world fell in place. If you can get man in place, then the world will automatically fall in place. That's a Hebrew word mentioned in Genesis chapter 1. Three times, it's the Hebrew word bara. It's in Genesis 1 and 1, Genesis 1 21, and then Genesis 1 26. It is our English word create. In Genesis 1 and 1, he created the firmament. Genesis 1 21, he created the bodies of water. In Genesis 1 26, he created man. After God finished creating what he was going to create, he turned around and started making stuff out of what he created. And when he got ready to make what he was making, he did not speak to what he was making, but spoke to what he was making it from. For instance, when he got ready to bring forth grass, he spoke to the ground. Earth bring forth seed yielding after its kind. When he got ready to bring forth fish, he spoke to the water. Bring forth abundance of fish. When he got ready to make man, he spoke to himself. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. Now, whatever he brought it from, it had to stay connected with to keep living. For grass to continue to live, grass had to stay connected to the ground. For fish to continue to live, fish had to stay connected with the water. And for man to keep living, man had to stay connected with God. Now if you want to kill either of, just pull them up from their environment. If you want to kill grass, pull it up from the ground. Want to kill fish, take them out of the water. If you want to kill man, just separate him from God. Genesis this is this unique book that deal with the beginning and creation. Matter of fact, the formula of science is described in Genesis 1 and 1, five steps to the formula of science, time, force, motion, space, matter. Here it is in Genesis 1 and 1. In the beginning, that's time. God, that's force. Created, that's motion. Heaven, that's space. Earth, that's matter. God was unique in his creation he set things in order. Each day he did a certain thing. First day he created the firmament. Second day he created light. Then 
vegetation, and then fowls of the air, then fish of the sea. And on the sixth day morning, he created the animal kingdom. And late that sixth day evening, he created man. Now remember, six is short of perfection. Seven is perfection. Man was made on day six, which means he is short. Uh, he, he's, he's short of something. So when you see a man messing up, remember he's a six. He's, he's, he's short of perfection. When God made man, he made him a trichonomist. Not die, but try. He is body, he's soul, he's spirit. Genesis 2, 7, he formed man from the dust. That's the body. Breathe into his nostril the breath. Hebrew word ruach, R-U-A-C-H. And man became a living soul. He's body. He is soul. He is spirit. With his body, he deal with world consciousness. With his soul, he deal with self-consciousness. With spirit, he deal with God consciousness. With body, he looks out. Soul, he looks in. Spirit, he looks up. He is try, not die. I try to get it over to people that in it, whenever a person go out and take somebody's life, you don't know how much trouble you're in. Genesis chapter 4 verse 8, the Bible says, and Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. The word slew, the Hebrew word means slaughter. It means he took a knife and cut his brother's throat. He gutted his brother, cut him up into pieces and laid his brother on the altar and said, God, if you want a sacrifice, let me give you one. God came and he said to Cain, Cain, where's Abel, thou brother? Cain got upset with God, said, am I my brother's keeper? He said, well, the reason I came is because I heard his blood. And the Hebrew word for blood is the word dumb, but it's in plural form, which means he didn't just hear Abel's blood. He heard all of Abel's descendants' blood. You see, when you kill a person, you don't just kill that person. You kill all of the descendants. My daddy fathered 18 children, and 18 of us produced 100 and the hundred have produced about 500, just three generations of us. And if some had had a killed daddy when he was 18, they wouldn't have just killed him. They would have killed the whole 500. Talk to me, somebody. And you have to give an account, not just for the one you took, but the 500. Yo, he ain't saying nothing in this house. Man, his body, he sold. He screamed, thank God for the body. God did a good job when he made the body. Psalms 100 said, it is he that have made us and not we ourselves. Romans 12 and 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body a living sacrifice. 1 Corinthians 6, 19, no, you're not, you're not your own. You have been bought with a price. Therefore, glorify God in your bodies he did a good job when he made man's body he gave him 263 bones 600 muscles 970 miles of blood vessels 32 feet of intestines 32 teeth in his mouth eyes like cameras every time they flash take a picture send it to the brain to be developed a heart that beat from 60 to 80 times a minute on an average of 72 times per minute a tongue with 400 cups that can pick up the sweets and the sours. 20,000 tainted hairs in his ear that can pick up the highs and the low. Hand with 27 bones that represent the 27 books of the New Testament. It is he that made us. 
not only did he give us these sails, he gave us mobile sails, red sails and white sails. Red sails are large in number but smaller in size. White sails are large in size but smaller in number. Here is how they work. If I hit my hand and as soon as I hit my hand, trying to get a nail, but hit my hand, a swell shows up. The swell in my hand is really the death of the white sails. They rushed to the camp where I was hurt to give their life for the recovery of my finger. And once they die for the recovery of my finger, pus show up, that's the death of the white sails. But then the rest of the white sails email the red sails, say we have done our job. The red sails come and clean up the mess that the white sails made, and then a scab show up and I'm healed. Because it is he that have made us, and not we our self. Thank God for the body. But that's not all a man is just to body. That's just one part a man. He says in Genesis 1 and 20, God said, let us. Watch everything else God brought forth. He just spoke it. He spoke light appeared. He spoke firmament shows up. He spoke fowls began to air. He spoke fish began to swim. He spoke beasts began to roam. But when he got to man, he switches in the text. Instead of just speaking it, he called together the council and said, let us. Talk to me, somebody. You see, the Father said, I will make him. The Son said, I will save him. The Holy Spirit said, I will keep him. Let us make man in our image, which means man should be an extension of the presence of God. You know how when you're in the house painting, you get ready to paint the ceiling, you're too short to reach it. You put an extension on your brush to reach what you couldn't reach without the extension. God said, man, is God's extension. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 2 and 10, he said, we are his workmanship. The Greek word for workmanship is poema. When you get the word poenis, when you get the English word poem form, a poem is a work of art. Preach Reverend Ray. That means man is God's work of art. Have I got any help in this house? And whenever you have a poem, a good work of art, you don't hide it in the closet. You don't put it under the mattress. But you put it on this place so others can see your work of art. What better way to demonstrate who God is that he can take his red blood, put it on a black heart, and wash it whiter than snow. I wish you had some help in this and that fellow that used to be a dope addict, wino, and when somebody see him now, he can stand. I was alone an island. I was a sinner too. But I heard the voice of Jesus saying, there is work to do. I took my master's hand. And I joined the Christian bear. Now I'm on the battlefield for the Lord. He should be an extension of the presence of God. But he said, and after my likeness, man should be an expression of the person of God. In other words, God was so in love with his son. Romans 8, 29, for whom he did foreknow, them he also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. He was so in love with his son till he decided to populate the world with a lot of folk that looked like his boy. And here's what God do. 
when God spots something in you that don't favor his son, he decides to perform surgery on you. <laughs> Got any help in this house? I make a health drink when I travel across the country and somewhere every week. I make it out of lemons, but to get what I need out of the lemons, I have to put pressure on the lemons. And when I put pressure on the lemons, two things come out of the lemons. The mess and the best. <laughs> but the mess always come out first. And the reason the Lord put pressure on us sometimes, he sees some mess in us. <laughs> Do I have a witness? When they get through getting the mess out, the best show up. And Philippians chapter 1, 6, he had, that has begun a good work in you will perform until the day of Jesus Christ. Mean this, he ain't going to stop working on you till he gets you where he wants you to be. And, when, and, and what I love about God, while he's performing surgery on me, he covered me up. So he, you can't see him working on me. He's working on me undercover. Do I have a witness? I'll be out of here in a moment. And when God gets through working on us, all of us will be standing together. And Jesus will be standing in the midst of us. And the angels will be out there looking at us. And the angels will start hunching each other, saying, which one is Jesus? Because when he shall appear, <laughs> we shall be like him. Do I have a witness? <sighs> we should be an extension of the presence of God, expression of the person of God. But then they say, and let him have dominion. Which means we must be an exhibit of the power of God. God don't want us to be powerless. Matthew 28, 18, Jesus came, speaks of all power. The Greek word is exousia, which means authority. Acts 1 and 8 says, you shall receive power. The Greek word is dunamis, where you get the word dynamite. Ephesians 6 and 10, find my brother, be strong in the Lord and the power. The Greek word is kratos. Matthew 16, 18, upon this rock I'll build my church. The Greek word is ecclesia. Here's what God do. He get his ecclesia, which is his authority, places it behind his ecclesia, which is his church, and get his dunamis and put in the church. And tell the church to seize the opportunities which are before the church. Let me put it in layman terminology. It means you ain't got to beat the devil running. <laughs> because of the power you got in you, the devil will run from you. Wrong person running. I'm trying to beat the devil. No, you ain't got to beat him running. You submit to the Lord and watch the devil run. Do I have a witness? God planned your life. Everything about you was planned by God. He planned the dawn of your life. <laughs> and what your mom and dad are deciding when you was going to be born, God planned it. Jeremiah 1 and 5, before you was formed in your mother's belly, he said, I knew you. <laughs> he said, I sanctified you. He said, I ordained you. God planned, you ain't no accident. You've been planned by God. Do I have a witness? You said that's Old Testament, well, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, according to whom he has chosen. The word chosen is in our tenth, and meant God acted alone without a supreme court, without a board of directors. It was his choice. But it's not only in our tenth, but in middle voice, which means he acted by himself, but for himself. That means you was chosen by God, but chosen for God. Yeah. And watch this. If you just stay in Ephesians 1, 4, he tell you when the election took place. He said it was before the foundation of the world. Y'all don't like me in this house. 
That's why you can't look at your birth certificate that mama gave you and determine your age. <laughs> Do I have a witness? See, God don't count like we count. We have to cut time in the segments and count yesterday, today, tomorrow, was, is, and shall be. But yesterday is in the tomb. Tomorrow is in the womb. Yesterday is a canceled check. Tomorrow is a promise every note. Yesterday is history. Tomorrow is mystery. Yesterday is recollection. Tomorrow is speculation. <laughs> but with God, everything is an eternal now. With God, yesterday is now. With God, today is now. With God, tomorrow is now. God never have to leave anywhere to get anywhere. <laughs> he's already where he's going and still where he was. He can tiptoe and stand flat at the same time. He can take a crooked stick and hit a straight lick. Do I have a witness? He planned the dawn of your life. But also plan the design of your life. <laughs> In other words, God decided if you was going to be a man or woman. <laughs> when your mama, <laughs> when your daddy, when your physician that made this, God, Lord, decided if you're going to be a man or woman. I ain't charging y'all for this. Listen. Whatever way God plan your life, stick with the plan. If God made you a man, stay a man. If God made you a woman, Stay, uh, a lady. A lady went to a doctor, uh, her, and said, "She went to the Lord and said, Lord, grant me long life." The Lord said, "It is done." She was so excited. The Lord told her she was going to live a long time, till she went and had her skin bleached. She had a face redone, shortened her ears up and straightened her nose, had a breast reduction, had a tummy tuck. In other words, she moved some stuff from the front to the back, sewed on some new hair. Walked out in front of the car, car ran over and killed her. She was so upset with God. So when she got to heaven, she went up and said, God, you told me I was going to live a long time. You let me get run over by a car. What happened? The Lord said, I didn't recognize you. Whatever. I know it's time to go. Whatever way God planned you, shake somebody's hand and say, stick with the plan. He planned the dawn of your life. He planned the design of your life. But God also planned the ditches in your life. Oh, Lord. <laughs> you see, some stuff you won't learn in life till you get in a ditch. Lord, uh, y'all don't like me in this house. Yeah, sometime growth won't take place until you get in a ditch. I can be walking down the street. I can run into people that have been in a ditch. I can pick them out anywhere. If you ain't been in no ditch, you walk by folk like they ain't even there. But if you ever been in a ditch, <laughs> you know how to say, God bless you. So glad to see you. Have I got a witness here? 
oh I'm alright this morning because 7.30 in the morning you wouldn't be coming to church if you hadn't been in a ditch have I got a witness because you've been in a ditch you know how to sing father I stretch my hand to the uh, 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 no other Yep, I know. I got to let you go. Shake somebody's hand. Tell them, thank God. Yeah, for God's plan for man. But not only, Lord, does God plan your done, plan your design, plan your ditches, but God also plan your death Lord Revelation 118 Jesus said I'm he Lord that liveth he said I was dead but behold I am alive forevermore and then he said amen in the text normally amen would mean uh, it's over but he come back and say I have the key Lord, of death in my hand. You ever notice sometime a person, Lord, have a stroke and die before they get to the hospital? Others can have the same stroke and keep right on living. Yeah, you've seen people uh, have heart attacks and die before the next morning. But others can have it and, uh, and keep right on living. You know some people that have had cancer and die six months after it's discovered. Others can have it and, uh, and they're sitting right here this morning. You see people get shot with guns uh, and die on the operating table. <laughs> Others can get shot, but it's still in them, and they live in a happy life. You say, why is that preacher? Well, uh, Jesus, hold the key. Have I got a witness here? Which means you cannot die until the Lord uh, turn the key. Have I got a witness in there? I'm looking at somebody right now. Uh, you wondering why you're still here? Out of all the stuff you had to encounter. Uh, I got the answer to you this morning. Uh, you here because uh, Jesus uh, holding the key. <laughs> That's why every morning when you get up, uh, if you forget anything else, um, you ought to tell the Lord, thank you for not turning the key. It's not because uh, you've been eating right. It's not because uh, you've been jogging every morning. Uh, but the reason we're here, have I got a witness? Uh, it's because the God I serve, uh, he's holding the key have I got one witness thank God he knew when he brought me how long I was going to be here so I'm not worried about what can happen because in him we live in him we move oh, in him we have our being just shake one hand and say neighbor Thank you for letting me worship with you. But I'm not here because I got a PhD. I'm not here because I got a little money in my bank. I'm not here because I'm living so holy. But oh, I'm here because Jesus holding the key. Anybody know he'll hold it? Oh, <laughs> Won't he do it? <laughs> Won't he do it? <laughs> Won't he do it? <laughs>
yes, sir. <laughs> yes, sir. Was not that a wonderful sermon by the one and only living legend, Dr. Frank E. Ray? I want to thank each and every one of you for watching tonight. I know that it was a blessing for you. I pray that God continually bless you, keep you safe. Make sure that wherever the Lord leads you to do, as far as your church and your ministry, make sure one, you are spiritually guided by God's grace. And number two, make sure that you keep yourself and all of your membership and family safe. I know God is continually blessing you over and over again. And here's the beauty of God, that you can't have success without a little bit of struggle. So that means our National Baptist Convention is about to go to heights unknown because this year, even for our convention, has been the struggle, but success is right around the corner. I hope to see each and every one of you person to person when we make it to January to our mid-winter board meeting so all of us can come back together, fellowship with one another, praise God with one another, and thank God on how he brought us over. We pray God's blessings upon each and every one of you. Now may the grace of God, sweet communion of the Holy Spirit, rest rule and abide with each of you henceforth now and forever. May we all say amen. Remember, it is another day's journey, and I'm glad about it.